For 90 years, Crimson Dawn has held the Midsummer's Eve Festival to celebrate the summer solstice and to share the stories of Neil Forsling and her characters. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't be together at Crimson Dawn this year. However, we have taken this opportunity to create for you a virtual Midsummer's Eve event with all of Neil's characters, shrines, and solstice stories. So pour yourself some hot chocolate and get a plate of cookies Sit back and relax as our storyteller, Rebecca Hunt, takes us on a journey through the magical land of Crimson Dawn. So, just as a little background, when any of you who haven't been to Midsummer's Eve wouldn't know this, but everyone else would, Neil had magic rings that she always wore. They were rings of power that had been given her by the Cardinal Witch. And the start of the whole night was to stand out at the end of the trail here, tap the rings three times together, and that started the whole evening. Neil didn't have quite so much pomp and circumstance going on when she did her first Midsummer's Eve. In 1929, when she saw this property, she was astounded at how beautiful it was. She talked about walking out of the trees and seeing the red earth and the grasses and it looked like she was standing on the edge of a magical land here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to walk down the path from where we started along what used to be the original road to come into Crimson Dawn and we're going down to the Topaz Gate. The Topaz Gate is the entrance to this magical land. It is the region that is governed by the Topaz Witch. In the center of the painting behind me, there's a young woman with flowing golden hair and a golden robe and a golden hat. And sitting next to her is a woman in red. Those two are sisters. The woman in red is cardinal, and the woman in gold is topaz. They both come from Italy, from about 191 CE, so oh, almost 2,000 years ago. They were part of the larger Strega community in Italy. Cardinal chose to be a leader of witches, and eventually brought that here, and, and led the witches here. Topaz took another route, and she wanted to be domestic, and she wanted to be married, and she wanted to have children. And so she stepped a bit away from the traditional roles that she would have had. And she married a, a loving and kind and gentle king. And eventually they had twin boys. And they were incredibly happy together. And then the king died suddenly. And shortly thereafter, her two little boys died. She was bereft. She didn't want to be anywhere near she, where she'd been living. She didn't want to be reminded of all she'd lost. So her sister invited Topaz to come to Casper Mountain and live in the Topaz land and to guard the Topaz gate on, on the mountain. That is why we are now standing here in front of Topaz. She is going to let you through in, into the land and so pay your respects to Topaz as you go by. She might give you a little token and then uh, once we have said farewell to her, we'll move on. As we walk around the corner here, you'll notice a, a log enclosure. Inside on the ground, you see a large star. And everything is sparkly and shiny. And there's a young woman with flowing white blonde hair. And she's walking around, and she's laughing, and she's throwing sparkles, fairy dust, on people. She especially likes to pick out people with blonde hair, or gray hair, or white hair. But she will pretty much equally the sparkles on anybody. What you don't know if you ask her to do that is she is bewitching you. And if she wants, she can use that to put you to sleep for a hundred years in the forest. Or she can make you sleep for an afternoon and you wake up and you never know what's happened. So beware, she's a bit of a trickster. She's a bit, a bit of an um, unpredictable character. She's the youngest of the witches. Her best friend is the oldest of the witches who is Emerald. So well, then you walk a little bit further down the path 
there's a place where there's the phantom wood chopper and the phantom wood chopper is a character who goes out and cuts in the forest and neil was quite concerned about that at first because she and jim made their living by cutting logs for cabins and and fence poles and 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 those sorts of things and they didn't want someone else coming in and uh, stealing their wood but every time she would go to confront him she'd see like a little puff of mist and she'd no longer hear chopping and there'd be no one there and then a few minutes later she'd hear it a little further off in the woods and then a little further off in the woods and it took her a long time to finally sneak up on him efficiently enough to catch him and then of course once you caught him he can no longer hide from you so he uh, agreed that he would keep his wood chopping to a certain certain kind of thing he said but I have to stay on the mountain I can't leave the mountain I'm in love and I'm in love with the moon maiden and she only comes down to see me on this mountain and so occasionally you will see the moon maiden coming down and holding court and she comes down when the sky is clear and the moon is full and she slides down on a moonbeam and they spend their evening until, until the dawn's light comes and then he doesn't get to see her for another month but maybe it's more than a month what if the sky is cloudy well, there's so many things that could happen so it's really not not a love with good prospects but he's he's refusing to give up on it so he's still here and occasionally you can hear the sound of the wood chopping and, and the mists in the woods. As we continue our walk down the path, I want to show you the witch you see in the middle talking to Topaz in the light sea green uh, robes, long fair hair. Um, what you can't really tell in that painting is that her uh, her hat is decorated with seashells. Undine has a rather unusual story. You can see in the shrine, when you see her shrine, that it's studded with uh, seashells of all kinds. And Undine is another term for a sea witch from Pacific Coast. And she used to, in the, in the summer night, she would go out and she would dance in the moonlight on the sand, and her robes would flow, and she had kind of a a sheen to her because she was a sea witch. And one night during World War II, as she was dancing on the shore, a flyer from a nearby Army Air Base in California saw her and he was enchanted. And he circled her once and he circled her twice and he circled her three times. And because he was training in a seaplane, he put down in the water, sort of glided up gently to the beach and stepped out and she was entranced because here was this great bird with a human who had stepped out of it and he started to talk to her and he told her how beautiful she was and he told her how interesting she was and and was there anything she would like and she said I would like to go flying in your big bird with you and so he said okay we will do that and he put her in the plane and, and they took off and they flew up over the ocean and then he started turning inward because he actually was going back to his base which was the Casper Army Air Base uh, out at what is now the airport and he had no intention of letting her go and so they flew and flew and they flew long and they flew high and her feet got cold and I said well here put on put on my moccasins put on my wool socks so she took off her slippers, which were her magical slippers. When she took them off, it broke some of her enchantment. And as they were flying over the west end of Casper Mountain, she fell out and she tumbled to the ground and she lay there. And then she got up and looked around and she realized that she was far away from her ocean. And she began to cry and wail and weep and when that happened, the mist started to rise. Pretty soon, she's crying and it's in the winds. And all the other witches were alarmed because they, they'd never run into her before. 
So they told Cardinal, and Cardinal says, well, bring her over here closer to where we are. We can, we can take care of her. And they, and they made her a little place to live, and they brought her shells. And, and all of a sudden, they noticed that seagulls were starting to come, and they were coming to comfort her as well. And they would bring her shells, and they would bring her seaweed. And it gave her some hope. But she realized after a time that she was never going to get back to her ocean. And she, so she's a very sad, sad creature. And sometimes she dances a little bit in the woods and the mists come up. When I was a child, I would walk in the woods on a dark night. And especially for some reason in the wintertime, the mists would roll in and they would smell of the sea. So I knew that Undine was, was unhappy and she was crying. And now as we come around the corner, you see a very large enclosure. And if you notice on the uh, trees around it, they're all covered with purple flowers of all kinds. And you notice that there's two creatures inside the enclosure. The first one you're likely to encounter is a beautiful woman who you can see dancing in the rocks with bright red hair and that is the lavender witch she is the mistress of this whole sort of section of crimson dawn it's a section of darker trees with open glades lavender is the one who is responsible also for any of the purple or blue flowers you would see out and about. So Lavender presents people with flowers as you come to her shrine. She also though has a very special responsibility and she is the one who helps keep track of and care for the other creature you see and that is Vermilion. He doesn't really say too much but you often see him covered in bits of mud porcupine quills or pine cones in his hair. He wears rusty robes, chains. We're not really sure where he came from, but the enchantment that captured him placed him on Casper Mountain. He is very interested in people. He's pretty good at hearing questions. He's pretty good at giving you directions. And sometimes he doesn't give you directions you know you want. So for instance, he will come up and he will look closely at you and he will count on his fingers or he will count on pine needles. And then he will say, five miles that way or four miles that way. And you know that something you have to do is going to be that way or that way. You're going to notice that there is a little better light. You've been in the pine forest, it's been kind of dark, and we're sort of angling a little bit towards sunset but you're starting to see some slightly more shimmering light out there. You come to a point on the trail where when you look up, standing on sort of a tall platform is a woman dressed all in green, who is the Emerald Witch. She is the oldest of the witches. She has been in competition with the Cardinal Witch for all the years they have been up here on the mountain. She very much resents the power that the Cardinal Witch has. And she also, because she, she loves anything green, so you notice there's peacock feathers. She likes green gems. And the Cardinal Witch has some very special, important green gems that are part of her magic. And Emerald wants those so much. And right up here on the mantle, you can see there's a little uh, cup. And hidden in that cup, and Emerald doesn't know they're there, are the seven magical green stones. They're here because Cardinal gave them to 
meal for safekeeping. And so each separate person who is the storyteller is responsible for those magical stones. When Neil no longer told the stories, it was her daughter Jean. And when Jean died and was buried on, on the Red Butte, then her sister Mary took up that. And then in 1991, they passed that responsibility and the green stones to me. I think Emerald maybe guesses that I have them, but there's no way she can take them away from me. So there's this kind of tension underlying some of what's going on among the, the seven witches on the mountain. Here we are at a very special place. If you look at the picture up here, you see a, a witch in a black dress with a cane with blue fringe on her dress. She is the black witch. She is probably the one who looks most like most people would expect a witch to look. She's kind of old and she's got yeah, you know, a wart on her nose, kind of like I do, and she looks like she could be pretty scary. But she's a really good example of don't judge people by how they look. She is actually one of the nicest, kindest witches in the forest. She is always making up potions, always making up concoctions, always doing a little bit of magic. But it's not the kind of magic that's going to hurt anyone. And if you are a child coming to Midsummer's Eve, you might find that what you're going to get from her might be a bottle of enchanted bubbles or an enchanted lollipop. And they won't do anything bad for you. It's something she does because she really likes the children. The really interesting thing about Wyoming is that we have a tendency to let people be who they are to not give them a lot of grief about who they are. And, and understanding the Black Witch is really important to understanding how accepting people in Wyoming can be. We're going to wind the trail, we're going to wind back in, and we're going to uh, finally come to a place where you see three little creatures. Remember I mentioned that there are three elves who live on this mountain. Their names are Branch, Root, Twig. Their job is to do a couple of things. They're the messenger from messengers from the Cardinal Witch to all the other creatures within this magic land. They will tell them when the Cardinal Witch needs them for a meeting or when they need to know something. But they also go in those cabins under, under all of this forest, and they're the ones who, with their big silver shears, will trim tree roots um, and help make sure there's some open parks and open spaces that are not covered over by pine trees. They're part of the natural system of the mountain. Normally they live in the caverns under Crimson Dawn. When they travel around above ground, you can see there is a, a stag behind them. And you notice he's made of wood. He will come alive when they need to ride and take them wherever they need to go. We only have two more stops before we're at the end of our journey on Midsummer's Eve at Crimson Dawn. As we walk along the edge of the butte here, you'll notice how red the earth is. And what we're doing is we're getting almost right over the roof of the Cardinal's house and inside the butte. And as we come and down over the edge, you are going to be seeing two figures sitting right on the edge of the butte, facing out towards Muddy Mountain. What you're going to be seeing is the Cardinal Witch, who is Topaz's sister. And of course, she's also the head witch here at Crimson Dawn. She is very, very old. She came to Crimson Dawn from the year 191. She is very wise and she's very connected into the whole world. So she keeps track of what's happening 
in most places around the world and then she can communicate to witches who are, are sort of looking over their own countries a bit to tell them what she has seen so that maybe they can head off some kind of trouble. She's lived for, for generations and generations and years in the Red Butte. It's lined all the way around with crystal like mirrors but she can see through and into other places in, in those mirrors. You might think that this was a very lonely existence and on some levels it is because it's one of very great responsibility but she has a companion the other figure that you see here and in fact I'm going to stop for a second and let you hear some faint ethereal music that is being played by the Cardinal Witch's companion, who is the Blind Minstrel. The Blind Minstrel was a traveling minstrel in the Middle Ages in Europe, and he went from kingdom to kingdom and told stories and played songs, and earned his keep while he was in that kingdom. But then he came to a kingdom where the monarch was so entranced with his storytelling and with his music that he decided he simply was not going to let him go. And the minstrel says, no, I'm a wandering minstrel. I have to go on, I have to go on. The king said no, and he blinded him. And when the cardinal witch saw this in one of her mirrors, she brought him to her in the crystal cavern and he has lived with her here on Casper Mountain for all that time. He plays music and he keeps her company. And the interesting thing about his music, and you may be hearing it today, people who don't know for sure what they're hearing will hear the notes. But sometimes they think it's the wind. And if you listen, the wind, but you can also hear in it the notes of the blind minstrel's heart. Bow down in farewell to the cardinal and to the blind minstrel. Then we're going to walk along the top of the butte and take in the scenery. And you know, a number of times that we've done, as we've done this, the full moon has come out, comes up over Muddy Mountain, and you get this beautiful full moon shining on you as you're walking between the Cardinal and our next stop. Or the mists will roll over and you'll feel the moisture. And maybe you'll even smell sea salt and you know that Undine is unhappy.